Welcome to the Artfully Learning audio series. I'm your host, Adam Zucker. Usually when I visit my parents, my mother will lay out a variety of materials on the bed in my childhood room for me to take back home with me. Among the objects are recent articles related to the arts and archival materials and works of art that I made as a child and adolescent. During one recent visit, I brought back several years' worth of mad magazines. I had subscribed to the magazine throughout my middle school years. Prior to that, I was a longtime subscriber of Highlights. On reflection, I realized that publications played an important role in my artistic development. The magazines that I subscribed to were all multidisciplinary in their approach to engaging diverse groups of readers. Each combined strong aesthetic elements with informational text that was educational and inspiring. Yes, even Mad Magazine, as you can learn a lot from satire. Growing up reading these magazines shaped a large part of who I am as an artist, educator, and citizen of my community and the world at large. My guest today is Myla Libin. She is an artist as well as a magazine and art book publisher, focused on bridging the gap between artists of all ages, backgrounds, and levels of artistic exposure. Her magazine, Mishu, focuses on artists and readers ages 15 and younger, but is also just as essential and engaging for emerging, mid-career, and established adult artists. The magazine highlights collaborations between generations through interactive sections and aims to validate children's identities as individuals and artists, while also encouraging intergenerational engagement through the arts. Thanks, Myla, for joining me today. You know, I like to start out by asking this question, you know, every every guest that I have on, I, I ask this question too, because it's it's always interesting. Everyone's answer is unique. I think this is probably the most unique question to ask in terms of art and art education. So what is your earliest memory or memories involving the arts? So it's funny because I'm friends with my kindergarten and first grade teacher on Facebook. And we just posted like a series of photos of notebook pages that my class had had done back when we were little kids. And it was like prompts about what you like about drawing and my answer was everything. And it was just really sweet to see that because obviously I don't remember <laughs> that far back. But so I went to a school that definitely um you know, encouraged art making um, in the classroom and out of the classroom. And I also had really supportive and have really supportive parents in that specific, um, you know, part of my life. But when I was thinking about what my first memory was, I took a, a trip to Prague when I was probably about three years old. And my mom and I kept a journal together and we would, you know, save like candy bar wrappers and museum tickets and write little anecdotes about the day. And even though that's not necessarily drawing, I still totally feel like that's art. And so that was one memory that came to mind. And then another one. So I grew up in Brooklyn and had a backyard and we had lime like, you know, stone slabs in the backyard, and my parents and I would paint on them sometimes, so that, that's another one. So yeah, that, that might be some of the earliest memories for me. <laughs> that's really cool. That I mean, going to Prague at, at age three, it's, that's quite an experience. Absolutely. We went to Prague, but then we traveled to Vienna and Budapest just because we were there. Um, I don't remember it that well, and you know, sometimes it's hard to know if your memories are based on like stories that you're told later or photos, but my mom still has that book that we kept together and it's like hardcover black book with a red spine. And it was just so like visceral when I hold it, I can feel it even though I can't necessarily see it. So yeah, that's a trip. Sounds like it. And I was going to ask too, if you still had some of the art you made as a child. I do. I fortunately, at least for me, because I want to, um, my mom really held on to a lot of the notebooks and art that I made as a kid. And I wouldn't say she's not a hoarder per se, but she's definitely a keeper of special things. Um, so, you know, she kept 
my school notebook where I was doing assignments and writing stories and then also um, drawings. My brother would make comics, so I would kind of sometimes add things to that. Um, we definitely have a lot of that tucked away. <laughs> That's cool. So there was a lot of collaboration. I collaborated with your mother on that book in Prague and then your brother as well with his comics. Yeah, and, and that's, I mean, that's definitely a big piece of Mishu for me is the intergenerational collaboration and encouraging, um, you know, conversation between young artists and kids and grown-ups. I had that, it was very present in my life to be taken seriously by adults and to be able to have um, creative connections with them. So that definitely has seeped into my adult life and, and what I want to emphasize with the magazine. On that note, why don't you just describe what Mishu Magazine is? Yeah, so I, I have another magazine, actually. It's called Dizzy, and it's targeted more towards adult, you know, grown-up readers. Um, it's a, also a printed art magazine. And from the very first issue of Dizzy, we always had a, a 12 and under section where we would feature a young artist. And we would go, sometimes if they were in New York, we would go to their homes and do little quote-unquote studio visits, which were often in their bedroom or their kitchen, and um, maybe draw together and ask questions and that was always one of my if not my favorite part of making the magazine just because of how inspired I would always feel after and um, so I wanted to expand upon that so that's that kind of what Mishu is it's, it's a continuation of that section um, with a focus more on artists under the age of 15 and then, again, like I said, intergenerational collaborations and then having working artists that are older make, um, you know, interactive sections or prompts for the readers. I know you have both contributions by these artists under 15. And you mentioned as well the intergenerational communication, the intergenerational dialogue that's in the magazine, too. So these... Uh, working artists who are, you know, who have assumedly gone to art school or in the, the field here are contributing works that are interactive and are they child-centered or are they works that are just, you know, what they do and then they're presented in a way that's accessible to all ages? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. I found that the artists that I asked to contribute to Mishu um, really enjoy taking a new approach to their art and how they're presenting it and knowing who's going to engage with it. Um, but we have a few sections where it's an older artist. So one of them is called Then and Now, and we show artwork from when a older artist was a, a kid and then what they make now and kind of prompt some questions about what similarities you see or where it's different. Um, then we also, I don't know, what else? I mean, my friend Kayla, who's like a co-editor in the magazine, always does the um, submissions prompt. So each issue has a submissions prompt, and that kind of informs, loosely informs the theme of the issue. And... Kayla always really, their prompt is also an artwork. Um, so I think that's really important is, you know, keeping what they do, keeping what the artists do in what they're making and, and having it still feel part of their practice. What comes up as we get older is we incorporate more of this kind of art speak you know, and we get away from actually talking about our work in tangible terms that's accessible. Or when I read artist statements, you know, descriptions of the artwork tend to be abstract when you look at the work in front of you and, and 
it's really simple to be describing, you know, what you do, what you make, how you make it. And so it sounds like your magazine is demystifying that language that we, you know, develop as we go to school, as we go to higher education in the arts, and is really making it accessible for all ages. Yeah, because I think that art, you know, when it comes to accessibility in art and the language that's used, it's important for to be accessible to, like you're saying, like people of all ages, um, not just kids. And another thing that I've noticed too, though, is kids, they enjoy seeing art and things that are not made, quote unquote, made for kids. Um, I did, for the very first issue, I had kind of like a, um, a group of 10, 11, 12 year olds look at the magazine and give me their feedback. And one of the things they said, they were like, I mean, they were a little older than kind of the target audience, but they were like, this is for kids. Like, we want to just see what we can aspire to make. Um, And that was an eye opening moment for me where I was like, oh, let's not totally simplify things because these readers want to be able to see where they could go or how to push themselves. Um, which can be frustrating at times when, you know, you're still, you're starting your journey of art making and you, I feel this way with my own. I'm like, oh, I can't really get it to look how I see it in my head. But that's really important to kind of push yourself to do that. Exactly. Yeah, that comes down to the artistic development. It's different phases. We're at different phases of development and everyone's really at multi-dimensional levels. It's not, it's, you know, some people have, strong concepts but can't visualize it on paper or through sculpture or animation in mm-hmm. the same way as others. So we all develop differently. I think that's the important part of having this focus that you have on such it's such a wide spectrum of artists and readers that you are creating each issue for. So so yeah, I mean there's definitely going to be a diversity in both their identity as an artist and their um individual personas too right on that note how how are young artists how can they get involved i mean it sounds like you have a lot of different dialogues with them and they sound like they're very critical too so the ability for them to take on that role you know as creator and assessor it's it's really advanced when we give the kids that platform like you're doing as you say you know they really want to create something that they have ownership of and they feel efficacious about right Yeah, and I I want, you know, in terms of diversity, I want readers to be able to look in the magazine and see themselves, um, as well as, you know, learning about all different types of people. So it's like trying to find that balance. Um, But in terms of getting involved, like I said, each issue, there's a submissions prompt, and that is on the website which is mishimagazine.com, so you can submit through there, but also, it's it's like, just reach out, Mishu is still a new publication, so it's, you know, it's really open, and I want to connect with as many people as I can, and I don't have a huge network of, of young artists, it's growing, but I also, um, I'm trying to get the magazine more into classrooms, to be, you know, like a resource that teachers can use if they want. Um, but anybody can reach out an email or, or go on the website. Yeah. No holding back. <laughs> <laughs> great. Yeah. That's, I mean, I, I was thinking that it would be great to have, you know, in classrooms how a lot of art educators have bookshelves in their classrooms, libraries. Um, I think, you know, K through 12, that's, that's your audience basically too. So, um, or three K through 12 now in New York, you know, we, Mm -hmm. we start very early in the arts and having a library, you know, is such an important thing. Uh, the amount of books that just children have when they have free time to go through during the day, which I think is so important. You know, they have this self-directed reading, um, you know, looking through the, the sections of your magazine too. It's something that really, a child can, at a very early age, I could see, you know, a reader as young as three looking at Mishu and, and 
on their own, really, and finding, you know, inspiration through it. Even if they can't, at that point, read every single article or piece in there, there's plenty of interactivity and visuals that are compelling for them and that prompt activity. I definitely think that it would be a valuable resource in classrooms and, you know, museums too, other cultural mm-hmm. centers. Have you done any collaborations in that regard? Um, so I actually, so I was in Mexico um, in August and I curated a show at a gallery in Oaxaca that was um, centered around the, an issue of Dizzy, the other magazine I do that was featuring artists all based in Mexico. And during the exhibition, we had a workshop where um, young artists came and actually did the prompt for the following issue. So that was really special. And I'm hoping to do more things like that. I mean, since you brought up libraries, like the ultimate goal, I think for me is a few things. Having some sort of library would be amazing because I also love children's books and picture books and I would love to publish them and publish children's books that are by children um, and collaborative between ages. So that is what I hope to do more of in the future. And we do also have an online cartoon channel (laughs) and it's um, animations by grown-up artists geared towards a young audience. So that's another piece of the Mishu puzzle right now. Yeah, I was going to ask about that because the, it's the Mishu TV. Is that is that the official name for it or is it? It's, yeah, yeah, Mishu TV. And so that is, yeah, so I was watching some of those videos. They're, they're really great. I didn't, I didn't realize, so that's adult, um, these are adult artists creating for children. And they're not artists that typically do that. So like I mentioned earlier, um, you know, I've asked these artists, hey, would you mind approaching your work differently and making something that can be more accessible to younger people? And I think it's been really gratifying for them, and it's been so fun for me. And I definitely think that those animations are something that... um, older people can also enjoy at least i do (laughs) yeah there's definitely it looks it looks so fun and playful and i was going to ask you too because your background too you have an animation background you have a video and film background how has this focus on this intergenerational focus inspired or influenced your own practice too and what you make you know as a as an adult artist as a mature artist how has working with kids and creating work and publications and videos for kids shifted your practice in any way, or has it? Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting question um, that maybe I haven't, like, thought about so explicitly, but I, I definitely think that it's shifted, um, especially in terms of, like, design and layout, because I do it for both magazines, for Dizzy and Mishu, and just kind of the, the, the freedom or the way that I can, like, loosen up a little bit um, when I'm doing the design has been so amazing. And just seeing, you know, the absence of ego and the uh, openness for collaboration, I think that one of the things that happens when you get older is you lose that, um, you know, you lose the openness like I said the openness to collaborating and working with other people because in the art world there's definitely definitely a lot of like I need to do x y and z in order to make it or I don't know I don't want to speak for anybody I think that there's amazing parts of the art world but that is what I see change as people get older you know when you're a kid and you're in a classroom you're working with you know, 10, 15, 20 other artists, and you get so much from that kind of collaboration and experience. So I think that that's something that um, I've, you know, been thinking about more. Yeah, that's, that is true. You know, we go through being in the classroom to being in the studio. It's quite a shift. 
Uh, mm-hmm. I think I think that what you mentioned too about the ego is is really important. You know, it, it has shaped me being in the classroom, experiencing the way kids work on their own artwork, help each other out. You know, they're very eager to be a part of it all. I mean, they take role in everything from helping yeah. out their peers to and then talking about their work too. It's it's in such an open way, and there is this this manner in which they approach art that's that's really it's sophisticated you know this in the same way that i i think that i would go into the studio to create you know there's definitely that seriousness they're very there there's not this um you know i i don't think it's at all watered down the way a child creates an artwork they're, i totally agree i mean you see kids drawing and it's like so hyper focused yeah. <laughs> in a really cool way um and I think also just the, you know, when you're a kid, everything is so new, just kind of trying to hold on to that and not being afraid of making mistakes and being excited about learning new things. I, I think that the, the experience of learning something new as a grown-up is so cool, and it rarely happens where it's like, you know what, I'm just going to try to learn a new language or like push myself to try a different medium um at least you know speaking from my own experience it is easy to get kind of stuck in your ways or your comfort zone whereas kids there's that comfort zone is so different because everything's new and they're like so much hungrier for the you know learning about new things sure definitely yeah there's a lot more risk taking right mm-hmm. i mean it's 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 definitely true. I think it it would behoove us all to get back to that framework. Yeah. You know that whole idea of this. What I like to to call lifelong kindergarten. It's you know it's it's a way of as you're talking about you know learning through just exploring, using materials in unique ways, and just finding out who you are through yeah. creating. You know that that whole thing is so important and. Yeah, and I think, you know, somewhere down the line, unfortunately, it gets, like, hammered out of us, uh, and we develop this this kind of framework of what we need to be as adults, but really, I mean, when we get back down to the foundation of it, you know, play is still important, and we see that when we are in the room watching kids being so hyper-focused in their work, and they're creating yeah. these powerful... Uh, theme you know they're expressing powerful themes through their work too I and mean, kids are so incredibly sophisticated in what they want to communicate Even and they're really honest too which <laughs> is something special that that is perhaps perhaps that's probably the most profound part of it too is how honest they are through the and how you know creating artwork allows them to open up even more and be yeah. even more critical in, in what yeah. they're saying, yeah. I know you just released an issue of uh, Dizzy. What's what's next for, for both magazines for your uh, and for the animation? Um, yeah. Anything on the horizon that we should know about? So right now, now that I finished the new issue of Dizzy, I'm focusing on the next issue of Mishu, um, which is pretty well underway, which is exciting. And the theme is weather, um, so it'll have quite a big range of content from, you know, a snowflake tutorial to an interview with young climate change activists um, to, you know, finding the weather within your body, and in the last issue we prompted the readers to write wind poems, and we got, I mean, it's I wasn't expecting it, but we got a ton of submissions, so there are going to be some really beautiful poems in it, and hopefully that's coming out in June. Um, That's the plan. (laughs) Excellent, and we can order that through uh, the the Mishu website. Yeah, and the first two issues are still available, um, so those can be ordered as well. And yeah, and also what's happening. And also, to, just to note, too, that the, the contribution, um, besides this intergenerational 
dialogue and collaboration, which is so important on a you know pedagogical and experiential level and creative level. Uh, you know, so sales from the magazine go to support education and child-centered institutions. Is that correct? Yeah, so 50% um, of each issue, I donate physical copies of the magazine to schools and nonprofit organizations working with children in the arts. And so if anybody that's listening you know, wants magazines for their classroom or their organization, they should definitely reach out to me um, because I want to I want to distribute 50 percent of each magazine for free to kids. It's amazing. Yes. Kids need these, you know, teachers yeah. need these, parents need these, caregivers. Yeah, totally, totally. So important and cool. So, yeah. Well, thank you, Myla, for speaking with me today. It's so inspirational and incredible, and um, yeah, looking forward to reading more. Thank you so much.